Hello, good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Um, just before starting, uh, I just want to check with you, uh, do you guys have any questions about the assignment? Just checking if you have any comments in the chat. How is it going? So Sina, for question one C, we are, are we only supposed to use two if statements? Are loops not allowed? Okay, let me remember because I don't remember from the top of my head what was part um, one C. So one C, you can okay, I see. So that's for the for the looping um, of the interactions uh, of the individuals, basically the time the time simulation or time evolution, if you wish. Um, you can use uh, so the the looping is okay. Um, uh, let me see if I'm not getting confused. So once you don't need, you don't need the means. Oh, you don't need any looping for one. So one C for the function that creates the matrix. Oh, one D, one D. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was also a little bit confused. So for one D, uh, you can use loops. That's okay. You you can use loops. Um, the if statement. Let me see. That's true. You can use. Uh, actually, there are different ways in which you can implement this with if statements. You can use. I think two is okay. You can even use one more, uh, depending how you implement things. Um, but you can use if statements and you can use loops. You can also, there is a very elegant solution, which is not the one I'm really asking for here, but if you do a very abstraction layer of the problem, you can convert this problem into basically a linear algebra problem with all matrix manipulation. I'm not, I'm not going there here. Um, the for loop is okay. You can use also one of the apply functions that we discussed last time. So I will say there is some freedom in how you implement this part. If you have any, any concrete, uh, you know, bottleneck or something that is, is stopping you from, from doing that, just um, let me know. We can, I, I can comment more on that, but because there are different ways in you can, you can uh, implement this part and part, uh, well, part 1E is very, very straightforward, but uh, part 1D you can, you can do in different ways. Uh, but yes, you can use a for loop, you can use, uh, and you can use a couple of if statements. That's, that's okay too. And some people, if they, if they feel like going into the math representation of the problem, you can also use, use no for loop whatsoever. Uh, and I believe not if statement needed. But that will be the two streams, basically, and solutions within that. Not sure if that um, answer your question. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Uh, so let's get started with the lecture. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. So I think this is the last uh, part we saw last class. Any questions about these apply functions? No, it was all, all clear. Um, so I'm just trying to get my list. There we go. So, uh, so the next topic, if you guys don't have any questions about this, is a statistical modeling and how to do this in R. And I mentioned to this, I had a, a wrap up slide at the end of this batch of slides. Uh, depending if you guys are interested, we can dive more into this. I think I mentioned to this last class, the plan is, and I already uploaded the next batch of slides, I, as I haven't uh, heard any comments from you guys, the plan will be to finish this, this basic um, uh, modeling section in R, jump a little bit into visualization, which will take us um, maybe two or three lectures, depending how fast we go and then uh, doing high performance are at the end. But as I say, all these targets are, are 
moving targets, if you wish, in the sense that if you guys express any any uh, interest in covering any other different topic, I, I'm keen to move things around. Uh, but as I haven't heard anything from you guys, I, I'm going to stick to this plan. But as I say, feel free to let me know. So let's go back to the to the uh, material then. So one of the important applications of statistics in, in general is uh, the fitting of models uh, to empirical data, also known as modeling, and people refer to this in different ways depending on the fields. Um, some people even call this machine learning or, or the very basic elements of machine learning. Uh, but this is nothing else than, than just collecting data, uh, trying to establish an analytical uh, relationship between the data or the observables that you have in your data, and then, and then try to see how, how well it behaves. So usually you will find these, these steps uh, in, in any kind of process where there is this type of, of um, final goal that is trying to be achieved. You will collect data. We usually refer, refer to these as observations. You will assume or propose a given relationship. This is known as the model between the variables in the observations, uh, a functional relationship usually, and then try to apply your model or, or fit the model um, and then this is the important part that many, many times uh, is missing is, is to test, evaluate, and analyze how the model uh, relates to the data. So how the, propo the proposition of the analytical relationship that you did uh, is, is sustained by the data that you're using. Again, this can be another of the topics that we can discuss. I'm not having the material here, but I, I do have the material. I will be happy to discuss this, how to do it in general. Uh, but as I say, the, the plan right now doesn't include that, but we can make room for that if you wish. So I think I, I mentioned this depending on, on the field. This is called modeling, fitting, regression, um, etc. So we are going to see an example with the simplest possible model that one can um, assume or propose for a data, which is a linear model. Now, having said that, the, the technique that we are going to describe and see can be applied not only for linear models, but more general models. So basically it's the same concept. So in this case, we're going to suggest, or we're going to assume that there is an underlying uh, relationship between the variables y and x. Um, x is the independent variable or, or uh, the explanatory variable, and y is what we usually refer as the dependent variable or, or a response variable. So y usually is given by, if it is a linear model, a constant sign x plus another constant b. Now, one thing to bear in mind, and this is true in general for every kind of uh, real data observation that you consider is the actual relationship between y and x is not only given by a and b, it is also uh, includes some noise in the data. And this is intrinsic, this is inherited by any uh, data acquisition process, as we know. So that's something to bear in mind and that will somehow pollute our results, but also will give us um, more robustness by, by performing a statistical analysis of this. So the example that we're going to use is based on one of the R data frames is, is trees. We're basically going to assume or we're going to propose that the growth of a plant is given by a linear uh, relationship between the water temperature fertilizer insects that may um, contribute to the well-being of, uh, of the plant or not, and other things. Now, I will, I will even uh, simplify this even more, and I'm going to just, by looking at the trees data frame, as you can see here, um, consider the girth, the height, and the volume of a tree. And one of the things that I'm going to jump into right away, although we are going to see this in the next uh, topic, uh, is visualization. So one of the things that you can do, this is the data frame that comes with the R data set. One of the things that you can do directly is you can just plot the trees data frames. And what that will generate is this kind of representation on the, on the right um, upper part of the slide. Uh, is, is what we call a mosaic representation. And we, what, what it's doing is doing all possible uh, combinations of representations between the variables that are in the data set. So in this case, girth, height, and volume, these are the ones that appears in the diagonal of this mosaic representation of plots. And then what you get here is on the horizontal axis, the girth, and then on the vertical axis, the, the height. So this plot is height versus girth. Now here, 
you get volume versus girth. And here you get volume versus height. And same thing on the, on the top part. So this is basically the same plot, but with the axis revert. So this is, in this case, it's volume versus girth instead of being girth versus volume. Uh, you just revert the y and x axis. Similarly, here you get girth versus high uh, instead of, of, of high versus girth. Uh, and here you get uh, volume versus height. Um, so it's the same plots that are basically symmetrized with respect to the diagonal. There's a very quite, uh, quick and nice way of visualizing the, the trends that you have in your variables. And for instance, it's very easy to spot where there may be a linear trend between these variables. So for instance, I'm going to pick girls and volume. So I, I will say, okay, I want to look at this plot. I will focus on this plot, volume versus scale. Basically what I'm saying is I, I may, uh, by looking at the data, by exploring the data, I may be um, inclined to believe that there is a relationship between the volume of the tree and the girls of the tree. And there is a linear relationship, which is proportionality between volume and girls. And so if I want to focus just on this plot, I will issue the plot of trees, uh, dollar sign girls is the column girls and trees dollar sign volume is the column volume from the trees data frame. And the order here is X will represent the first entry of the function plot. And the second entry will be the Y variable. So basically you're plotting girls on the X axis and volume on the Y axis. And this is the plot a little bit bigger if you wish, uh, just to convince ourselves this, this can show a, a linear trend or the proportionality between volume and girls. So that's just a little bit of data exploration, data visualization if you wish. As I say, we're going to spend way more time looking into how to create plots um, on, this, on the next topic. But now let's try to see if we can create a model that relates these two variables. So the, the, the function in R that allow us to uh, fit a linear model or to perform a linear regression, as it's properly called, is the LM command, which stands for linear model. And the way is very simple, um, although there are some components that we need to understand. So LM is the function then way to, the way to write it or to specify is to specify what is our y variable, our response variable, or our dependent variable. And then comes this tilde symbol, which means is a formula or is a representation or is um, or depends on whatever comes on the right-hand side of this equation. So in this case, our independent variable or our uh, x variable is the girth, as we plot in the, in, uh, we show in the, in the plot. Now, if we run this, R will respond with saying, okay, we call, or you call the LM function with a formula that is specified that the volume is given by the girth, and it basically uh, output whatever is the coefficients. And in this case, this is the intercept or independent term in the, in the linear regression, and this is the coefficient in front of the girth. The way to interpret this is that the volume, which is the, the dependent variable, is given by the independent term, minus 36.493, uh, plus a coefficient multiplying the girth. So this is kind of like the slope. If we're thinking about a geometrical representation, this is the slope of the, of the line. And this is the point where the line intersects the y-axis. Um, similarly, in the same command, the same result you will have obtained, and some people prefer this notation to using the LM command, specifying just the name of the columns, volume as a function of girth, and then where the data is coming from. Data equal the, the data frame where the data comes from, okay? So very straightforward, very simple to implement uh, a linear model in R um, with, with a given data set. Now, a better way to do this, and i show you in a second why, is to instead of just running the LN command, is run the LN command, but assign it to a variable. And in this way, if you do that, it's the same command as we ran before, but now it's assigned it to a variable. Now, uh, if I want to see the results, I just can print M, which is the model that we just created, and then it will give you the same information. But now, more interestingly, I can apply functions to M, which is a variable of type model, because it's the result of the LM function, and I can ask for the coefficients of M. And the coefficients of n, as we just saw before, are the independent term, minus 36 point something, and the girls, five point something. 
Why this is useful? Because now we can use this, which is encapsulated in the variable associated to the model, to predict new values according to the model. So for doing that, so coef of m, as I showed you, has the two coefficients. What we are going to use is this percentas star percentas operator. We saw this one when we discussed about some of the linear algebra capabilities of R, some of the matrix vector multiplication features of R. And this is nothing else than the dot product or the inner product. It basically takes two vectors. It takes a vector X and a vector Y, multiply component by component, and then add these two. So what is happening here, what is happening here is it takes the two coefficients the independent term and the, and the um, a slope of the, of the line multiplies the independent term by one and then multiply the, independent, the slope by a given number and they add them together. This is nothing else than evaluating the model in the value where X is equal to 15.12 or in other words, where the girth of the tree is 15.12. And in that way, you can predict, you can evaluate which is the volume that a tree with a given girth will have. Just to convince yourself about this, or what I'm saying, or, or to try to digest this a little more, just try to run what is coef of m inner product of one zero and coef of m inner product of zero one. This, if you follow the math, basically will tell you, okay, this first term will give me the independent term because the intercept is multiplied by one, the girth is multiplied by zero. When they, I add them together, I just get the intercept. This other term, when I multiply zero by the intercept, gives me zero. When I multiply one by the girth, give me the value of the girth of the slope of the line. Then I'm getting just the value of the slope. Okay. So a little bit of math of getting used to this. But this, this way we can evaluate, we can predict what is the volume of a tree under the assumption of the linear model that we created by, for a given tree of a given girth. Okay, any questions about this? The other thing that is interesting to analyze from uh, the model itself is to remember the summary command that we saw some time ago that it basically give you the scripted statistics of data frames or, or data sets. Well, the summary command can be also used on the model itself. And it gives you some things that are quite interesting. So it records you what is the, the fit that you did the formula that you use, but it also gives you information about the residuals. The residuals are quite important to understand just to see how, how robust and how valid is the model with respect to the data. And as I say, it will fall into this category of model diagnosis uh, or model diagnostics, um, but it's important and it's also part of the information that the model gives you. In addition to that, it gives you more details of the coefficients that uh, we use for creating the model. So these are the values that we got but we can also get the standard error. We can get a T value with another way to quantify the statistical robustness of these values. Or more interestingly, or more frequently used is the P value. And as you can see for this particular model, these are quite significant values, meaning that our statistical analysis or statistical robustness of this model, of these coefficients are, are quite, uh, quite strong. Um, and then give you a bit more of, of other informations. These ones are interesting in particular when you start to compare different models to see which model is the best for my data. Okay, but there is a lot of interesting information to analyze that's just by looking at the summary of the model. Okay, one more thing that will be interesting to see is how our model relates to the data in a visualization, in a plot. So we plot with this command before the girls and the volume, basically the volume of the tree versus as a function of the girls of the tree. If I want to add the model, for a linear model, this is quite simple. I can use the ABLADI function, which basically takes a, 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 is a function that draw a straight line. And in this case, the straight line is given by two coefficients, the two coefficients that define the, 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 the linear model, in this case, the independent term and, and the slope. And that is what M is giving you. So basically the, the circles here or the dots, uh, uh, the hollow dots represents the data and the straight line represents the model, the linear relationship that we just um, prescribe or, or fit for the data. And it's not bad, it's not bad. 
The question is, can we improve upon that? Well, if we want to do it systematically and formally, we should do this, this kind of analysis of the model and see if there are suspicious points or influential points or outliners or something that would give us a statistical confidence about the model. What I'm going to do in this case is just a very naive approach of cranking up the degree of the model. And instead of doing a linear regression with a linear model, I'm going to use a quadratic model. But in, in general, when one to do, uh, wants to do this in a more formal framework with, with meaning with um, statistical support or evidence, then we should do a, some sort of more um, detailed analysis of the, of the coefficients and the models itself. But for the sake of, the, of, of showing how to, you will do it, let's, let's propose or let's assume that we want to try a quadratic model for the girl plus a linear contribution. So in other words, our, our generalization from the first model or linear model is the volume, which was before given by a constant times the curves plus another constant. Now it's going to be given by a constant times uh, contributions of girls to the power of two squared plus the previous dependency that we have. Okay, so it's a quadratic dependency on the curves. That's, that's basically it. So for building this model, now what we need to do is, because the girls we have in the data set, but we don't have dependencies of girls squared. So we need to create a vector where we store the values of girls to the power of two. Okay, so that will be the first step. Then we are going to create our model. We are going to call it M2 uh, in contrast to M. We are still going to use the LM function. Our, in, our dependent variables is still the volume. We still want to predict what is going to be the volume of a, of a tree with a given girl. But now our formula changes. So the volume is a function or is given by a linear term in girls plus a quadratic term in girls, which is given by the vector girls two that we just compute. And the data is coming from the tree state of frame. Okay. As I told you, we are still using the LM function we are only going to abandon the LM function when we are in presence of what we call generalized linear models. And generalized linear models has a statistical justification for, for them. It's not that we want to do a function that is not linear or not polynomial or not quadratic. It's when we have evidence that the assumptions that the linear regression method used uh, underneath to compute the coefficients of our fits do not uh, hold. Okay, and as I say, this, this falls into the topic of model like nodes, um, but I just want to let you know there is another function called CLM that is for generalized linear models. Now, if we consider the, the coefficients now of the model M2 that we just created, now we can see that there is the intercept, which is the independent term C in this case of the equation, the coefficient in front of the linear term B, and then GERS2 represents the coefficient in, term in front of the quadratic term of the model. And one thing that I invite you to do, I'm not showing the plots here, is to do plot of the model. If you do plot of the model, you're, you're going to see some of these uh, family of plots that are used to identify um, or, or to qualify the, 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 the quality of the model with respect to the data. Things like the residuals, QQ plots, those kind of things. Again, we'll be happy to, to add this material uh, to a future lecture if you guys are interested, um, but just to let you know. Now, the other thing we would like to do is to create this plot that I'm showing you here, which is the data, the linear model, and the quadratic model represented in red, okay? And so we can compare and see which one, at least visually, is, is more appealing. So we did this in the previous slide. We plot the data, we add the linear model. Adding the quadratic model, unfortunately, is not as easy as adding the linear model to the plot. So we need to do some, some um, data manipulation and data generation for doing that. So there are two distinct ways, alternative ways of doing that. I show you one first and I show you another after, but uh, these ones that are separated with this horizontal line, are, they, they achieve the same thing. They represent the quadratic model. So you don't need to do both. You just pick one and I tell you which one is, is which one has each features or different features for each other. So the first, the first one is to create a new grid of values for the X axis. So XX is going to be a vector that starts at the minimum value of the data uh, for the girls goes up to the maximum 
to this point in X, and then we populate or we generate uniformly on uniform values between the minimum and the maximum with as many points as data points we have. So the idea here is we just take the minimum, the maximum of the range in X, and then we say we want, I don't know, 20 points, whatever number of points, length gives you how many points, and you generate that uniform. Okay, so we generate a, a, a grid X, XX in this case, and with that, we evaluate in the same way as we did before. So I'm using the coefficients from the model. This is another way, instead of using the coef function, I can do M, M2 dollar sign coef. There is a lot of information encapsulated in the model, by the way. This is one of the, the ways that you can do it, or you can use the coef M2 function, whatever you prefer. Then we use our dot or inner product operator. And then, because now we have three, we have three terms, we can just not do C1 and, and then the X. We need to do one X and the X square. And that's exactly what we are doing. And we are using a row bind. So it's going to be a row vector. So the inner product works properly. You had a column vector and a row vector. So you do once, it's going to be propagated as as many elements the vector has with ones. The second one is X. Uh, in this case, it's, it's just going to be the range of values that we generated. And the third one, the third element in the, in the vector is going to be the X squares. Okay, so the, the, the power of two of these quantities. After we compute YY, that is the evaluation of the model in this new grid, in these new values in X, we just use the lines command. The lines command creates a line given by the coordinates X and Y. And then we say that the line width is two, so it's a little bit thicker than the default width. And then the color is two, and that's why it's red. So this is one way of adding the quadratic model to our plot. An alternative way, an alternative way is to use directly the values provided by the girls. So I'm going to perform exactly the same operation as I did here. I'm going to call this YM2, just to distinguish from YY. And I'm going to say N2 coefficients, inner product, and then R bind, the one for the independent term, the linear term is given by the values of the girls, and the linear and the coefficients, quadra the quadratic coefficients of the, of the X is given by the girls square. I could have used curves two as well here, that's a very really much. Okay, but that's the same computation. And now I add the lines, the X values are given by the values of the girls, and then the, the Y values are given by the evaluation of the model in these values, and then same trick as before, a thicker line and color red. Okay, the difference between these two, and as I say, you do one or the other, you don't need to do both, is that in this case, if your function is not a smooth, you get a, a, a smoother look of the curve because your points where the function is evaluated are uniformly distributed between the minimum and the maximum. In this second part, which has one less step as you don't generate this artificial XX grid for X, it just take the coordinates of the girls and evaluates the model there. In this case, you won't notice much difference because the, the quadratic representation of the curve is not, it's not so, um, complicated or, or, or uh, irregular. So you, you basically get the same, but for functions that are a little bit more, more irregular, then this, the second part uh, or the first approach in this case, give you a little bit of a smoother look. Okay. Any questions about this? So final comments on final comments about LM. As I, I think I mentioned this in spite of its name, the linear model function allows you to do just more than just fits uh, for polynomials, allow you to do coordinate transformations and other kinds of things. Uh, Decentralized linear models can be generated using the CLM function, which works pretty similarly to the LM function in terms of the functionality, but there are some, some theoretical implications underneath that one has to understand. Now, this, what I show you, in particular, the inner product to predict values is one way, it's a very basic way, it's a very interesting way, if you ask me, because it, it implies that you need to understand exactly what is going on when you want to predict new values in the model. But there is another way that you can do that with, with R, and this one is really interesting, in particular, when your functions start to get complicated and they are not so simple as linear regressions or quadratic functions or polynomials even. So 
what we can do is use the poly and predict function. So the poly function, what generates, is a family of polynomials. And the predict functions can take your model and generate or predict or evaluate your model in a given set of values. So I'm going to put in comparison how we did it in the examples. And I'm going to put in comparison how you will do it using poly and predict. So what we did in the example is we created a second degree um, values by taking the original girls and, put, and, and elevating to the power of two. And then we generated our model by using LM volume as a function of girls plus girls two. What you will do with poly is you won't need to generate this quadratic term contribution. You will do M2 is the linear model of the volume as a function. And this is where poly comes into place. A polynomial given by the data provided by the data girls and degree two. So you can crank up very easily the degree, take this to degree five, to degree 10, to whatever you think is the functional relationship that um, this, this data may, may underlie. So the polynomial will generate these this polynomials for you. For evaluating the model, what we did was, and I picked one of the methods as I show you, or the sequence of, of minimum up to maximum of the value, so what poly will require is that you also provide a range of values and requires that you provide a range of values structure in a particular manner. It requires that you provide a range of value structure as a data frame. Why? Well, because the predict function is a very robust and um, quite complex function. So it's expecting that the data comes as a data frame. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate the same range of values, but we are going to frame it as a data frame. So that's why you see data frame here and then basically the same, the same command as before. And how we are going to evaluate? Well, before we did the inner product of the coefficients and the R-bind. In this case, you don't need to do that. You just use predict of the model that you created and then whatever is the data frame that you use to generate your independent value. And, and that basically will work. Now, a word about uh, predict. Predict is super powerful super useful when one does machine learning algorithms because it's, it's the way to, uh, to actually predict new results from the machine learning algorithms. But in some cases, it can give you some spurious results in the sense of is, uh, if it is a polynomial and the polynomial has terms which are contribution of not independent orthogonal polynomials, then it can get confused. So, just, just more than anything, a word of advice, sometimes uh, predict doesn't necessarily understand what you're asking if it's not a kind of a trivial case or a complex case. Something in the middle will get confused, but it's a little bit of trial and error. So, okay, but it's a really powerful uh, function, especially if you're using polynomials of higher degree. Imagine if you had to put five degrees or 10 degrees or something like that in your expression, you don't want to do this by hand. You want to use poly and, and predict. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So a few final words about uh, some correlations and covariance estimators. These are usually it's a good idea to take a look at them when you're running uh, linear regression models. It give you information about how the data is related. Uh, a few things that one wants to or usually looks at is the variance and the covariance and correlation. Um, and there are some formulas here that reminds you, you should probably have taken some statistical courses on some just old memories maybe. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, you can have correlations for more than one variable and, 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 and covariance, which is the generalization of the variance for one variable to multiple variables. And of course, the correlation coefficient. Now the correlation coefficient is directly associated with, um, with linear modeling and people usually compute kind of out of the box uh, how, how does it work. But then including here is a, is a plot I, I really like, it's called the ans carted And what is showing, unfortunately the, the, the correlation coefficient value is not shown there, my, my slide got trim sort of, but all these four data sets has exactly the same value as the correlation coefficient. And it was a kind of relative high value, if you ask me, it was 0.70 something. Bottom line here is don't, don't only get to the value of the correlation coefficient without looking how your data 
uh, looks like in a plot. That's why I, I spent some time showing you how, how to visualize the data and the models generated, because all these, these, these plots uh, or these data sets are fit uh, with a linear model. And the correlation coefficient is uh, one that, some, that, again, depends a lot on the field, but it's relatively high, it's not low. Uh, for me, I wouldn't take as a, as a significant representation of, of a linear relationship between the data, but some people might. And if you look at the data, you can clearly see that in some cases, it does just no make any sense to have a linear representation for the data. So this clearly is a quadratic uh, relationship between the data. This is basically an independent relationship with the set of this point, with this triggering the line to have this shape. Uh, and similarly here, so these two cases, we could be in the presence of pretty, pretty much outliers or spurious points. For sure, points that are driving the models to a form that not necessarily can be the realistic form, bearing in mind this concept that every single data point has some noise associated with this or error in the measurements or whoever you want to call it. So my message for this slide is there are a lot of good statistical estimators that one can uh, also look at when creating these models to give us robustness and to give us confidence about how, how the model behaves in presence of the data and vice versa. Okay. So any, any questions about this? I think I have one more slide. Yeah, so this slide is just to show you a little bit of how to compute these quantities, in particular for the values, for the variables that we were looking, the, cor the correlation value. In this case, you can see it's a really high correlation value. In this case, we, we are almost guaranteeing the presence of a linear relationship in the data because we are talking about 97%, 0 0.97 uh, for, for the correlation between the variables that we are analyzing. The covariance is, is a little bit of the measurement of how each variables vary with respect to each other. Uh, but we can compute the variance. And interestingly, we can also compute the standard deviation. We can also demonstrate that uh, the square root of the variance is nothing else than the standard deviation, numerical in this case, by looking at the data, asking this question. Okay, And there are a lot of other things that you can do with the core function. It, it can be used actually to run correlation tests, if you, if you wish. Okay. Let me just um, put my wrap up slide. And if you have time, we are going to, to start the visualization part. Um, as I told you this part, but we did in this, in this uh, slide was not even uh, scratching the, the tip of the iceberg of statistics. There are a lot of things that we can still cover. And again, depending on your interest, we, we could do it. Model diagnostics and validation is, is a very important one, if you ask me. Um, regression and more general models, including the GLM function, hypothesis testing, power analysis, machine learning, including classification algorithms. That can be something uh, interesting. Monte Carlo techniques, you have been exploring a little bit of this in, in, in the current assignment. Um, and then a statistical paradoxes, something like uh, I was describing about Anscombe Carter or this well-known Simpson amalgamation uh, paradox effect. Uh, all those things are quite relevant to, to the statistical analysis and, and, and that one has, has to be aware when, when performing this, uh, this study. Okay, so any, any questions about this? Uh, what you guys think if there are any questions, I'm going to draw my um, visualization slides. So that you guys can still see um, slides. So any questions for the linear regression part and uh, the few comments we did about that? No? All right, so let's then uh, move into the visualization uh, section of the course. So the idea here is that we're going to cover two main uh, areas in visualization or plotting. One is how to generate professional looking plots, meaning plots that can be part of your papers. Hopefully you will write a script and this is going to be one of the assignments. I'm not sure if it's the next one or, or, or the one coming after, but it's going to be one of the assignments to write a script to produce 
uh, professional quality plots. I, I'm going to, to instruct you which are the guidelines for doing that. Um, and then the other big topic, which I, I found to be quite useful, especially when doing data exploration and data um, visualization in an interactive manner is interactive plotting. Okay. And I'm going to focus in a particular package called Plotly. There are other packages, but I have found this is one of the, uh, I would say, nicer packages that offers a lot of, of um, uh, features and, 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 and nice things that you can just do. So, um, so for starting, what we're going to do is we're going to dive very quickly into the basics of R. And, and just to let you know, there are a couple of, of different uh, um, approaches to visualization or people use different, different approaches to visualization. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to teach you how to do this using the basic R approach. But uh, if, you, if you talk with people doing visualization in R, one of the big packages that people use is ShishiPlot. And personally, I, I, it's not that I don't like ShishiPlot, but I prefer to do uh, things doing just with the basic commands of R. The main advantage of doing that is you have more control. Um, ShishiPlot works very nicely. You can almost get uh, outstanding professional looking plot with a simple command out of the box with ccplot, things get nasty with ccplot when you want to customize something and it's not something that ccplot offers uh, to do straightforward. Um, having said that, in the second part, when we're going to do the interactive plotting, we're going to take a very, very quick crash course on ccplot because uh, the package plotly uses underneath or can use underneath uh, some of the ccplot capabilities. Okay, but it's just a big disclosure there that some people, instead of doing things with basic R plotting functionalities, instead they prefer to use ShishiPlot or ShishiPlot2, which is the latest version of ShishiPlot, um, just to let you know. In any case, let's start by exploring some of the face, uh, basic functionalities of plotting in R, for which we're going to use the plot command we, we saw just a few minutes ago. So what we're going to start is to generate a vector x, um, that takes values from 0 0.1, 0 0 0.001 up to, up to one. So it's a vector that goes basically from zero to one. And what we're going to do is just starting by plot a sinusoidal function. And in this case, you can just do plot sine of x times four times pi. That's give you a particular period for the function. Uh, and you can see if you plot that, basically R will, will do a lot of things for you by default. It will use circles or points for representing the symbols. And it will basically plot the value uh, of the function as the y value in the plot. And then the index of the vector is a vector with 100 elements because we're using the vector x that we define is going to be the x coordinate. Now, usually we prefer not to do that or in plots, usually the x coordinate or the x axis has some meaning. And if you want to use the actual value of x, the only thing you need to do is put x and then comma and then the function you want to plot. We just saw that in the previous example when representing the volume and the girth of the trees. But just to let you know, if you do just a quantity, what it will use as your x variable is the indices of the vector that represents that quantity. Also, another thing that R does by default is identifies the levels of the y and x axis as the quantities that you are inquiring to plot. Okay, but we're going to be able to control that. So for instance, one of the customizations or changes we can do is same quantities to be plotted in the X and Y coordinates, but now we are explicit about saying what type of plot we want. So we want to represent circles. So that's type equal quotation mark. So we want the color to be blue. So we can say color equal blue, and we want to turn off the axis. So if you compare to before the axis, which basically, um, uh, uh, where around the plot, where present by setting axis equal false, the axes are gone. You still have the, the levels of the, of the X and Y uh, coordinates, but no axis whatsoever. You can add the lines. We saw this command when we added the quadratic model to our function, uh, to our feed. Uh, what the lines uh, function does indeed is it connect by a small segment of lines the points that are used as, as the coordinates. So x and y here in the same positions, first and second position of the argument of the line function. And in this case, the color of the line is red. So in this case, instead of using the sinusoidal of 4 pi x, we're using 2 pi x. So it has 
twice the period is this in a certain fashion. Um, so that's a way to add lines. Uh, if we want to, to uh, change the, the access names, what we can do is title, we use the title function, and then we can do X labels, and then say, okay, this is tiny in seconds, or Y label, or a main title as well. So the title function allow you to control the titles on the, on the coordinates, X and Y, but also on the main, on the main plot as well. So some, some um, comments about the plot function. Um, some of the, I mentioned already, if one of the arguments is not specified, then it takes, it takes the, the, the X quantities to be the indices of the vector. Um, one thing that you will notice though, is every time you run the single plot function, it will override the previous graph. So if we want to turn off that feature, you basically we want to overlap plots, we need to use also the command par, which allow us to control a lot of the parameters in the graphical representation of the figures and set new equal true. So before running the second plot command, if we want to overlap plots, we run par new equal true, and then uh, the, the plots are going to be overlapped. You can also use the lines command, something that is, is feasible that the lines command actually will add a line to a previous existing plot. As a matter of fact, if you just use lines by default and there is no plot created before, uh, it won't work. It will tell you that it, it needs a previous existence of a plot in order to, to be able to draw the line, okay? Um, if you want to customize the access, as I, I was showing before, you can use annotation SQL fall and then combine that with title X label equal whatever is the title of your X label or your Y label. Another useful command, especially if you want to have multiple representations in multiple windows at the same time, is device.new. So device.new, if you issue, issue the command device.new, it will pop up a new graphical window where you can start to uh, plot new quantities as you wish. Um, the part new equal true, I already mentioned. You can also control the type of fonts that your plot use. This can be useful or interesting for some people when, when producing plots for a particular journal, for instance, you can control the formats of the, of the text. Uh, the default is equal to one and it's, it's normal fonts. Um, two is bold fonts, three is italic false, and four is bold or italic false. Uh, par annotation equal false, basically don't annotate the plot. And then this is a way to create subplots. Uh, so if you want to create a kind of two by two plots or insets, par uh, MF row uh, is the one that we want to, to use. We're going to see some examples. The other thing that is very important from part is the margins, how to control the margins of the plot so that the amount of white space surrounding the plot is minimized. That's something you want to do. That's something that is going to be part of the professional looking control of the plots that we're going to be doing. So let's see some example. Oh, one more thing. So I mentioned this uh, device.new uh, function that opens a new graphical window. Well, there is a few of these device dots functions. Device.list lists the graphical devices, meaning the graphical windows that you have open in case that you have multiple. Device.car identify which is the current one. So the, the graphic windows will be identified with numbers. So it tell you which is the one that your plot is going to be appearing. Uh, Device.off. Basically, turn off one graphical device. By default, it turn off the current one, but you can, let's say that we are in current equal three, and you want to turn off the zero, then you can do device.off zero, or something like that. Device.next goes to the next. Let's say that we had 10 windows and we set to one. Uh, so next and previous circulates back and forth that list of windows. These are the basic R ways to control graphical windows. They are not tied to any operating system, but depending on the operating system, meaning if you're using R in Unix, Mac OS, or Windows, there are some special um, functions uh, for Unix is X11, for Mac OS is Quartz, and for Windows is, is Windows, that in some cases give you additional functionalities. Now, my, my word of warning here is these sometimes are nice to use. For instance, if you launch your Windows in Mac OS with Quartz, you have some additional features by pressing command left and right arrow that allow you to circulate between previous plots, but that won't work if you are using uh, R in Windows or in Unix. So bottom line is uh, you gain some functionalities by using a specific 
um, graphics uh, commands like X11 of Warsaw Windows for a particular operating system, but the main short code not, um, not portable to other operating systems. Meaning you're developing in Mac OS, this may work for you, but if you give your code to a colleague running on Windows, those functionalities won't work. Actually, the quartz command will fail, okay? So bear in mind, because sometimes you see those features, some people like to use it, because as I say, you get extra um, features in the graphical representation, but they are not portable. So I will suggest to, to stick to the depth dot commands that are, are homogeneous across the operating systems. So let's take a, a quick look at some of the things I mentioned, in particular with the subplots. We are still using our vector uh, between 0 0.001 and 1. And what we're going to do now by issuing the command part mfrow c22, c creates a vector, basically saying, I want a representation of two by two, basically four slots in my, in my graphical window. Uh, we are going to create four subplots, four slots. Uh, you can think of a matrix representation for this, uh, a two by two matrix, a two by two slot representation of the plot. And if I issue a first command, similar to what we did before, now on the first quadrant of this two by two representation, we have the sinusoidal function. If I do another plot, uh, very similar as we did before, another sinusoidal function, now I'm setting the type to be lines and not dots, the color to be purple, and the white label to say this is a sinusoidal way. Now the plot goes to the next uh, slot in the matrix representation of the two by two uh, subplots. If I issue a new command plot, it goes to the third representation, the third quadrant. In this case, it's another sinusoidal function uh, with lines, a color brown, another title, and the width of the line to be 10. Uh, I, and I keep, I keep circulating, right? If I issue another plot, it will come here. If I issue another plot, it will come and overwrite this one unless, the par, unless I use the par uh, new equal true function that I mentioned before, okay? But this is basically how you can plot things in, in subplot arranges, okay? Any, any questions about this? All right. I just want to finish with some basic things. R offers a lot, but a lot of different plots that will basically just work. Of course, they will require customization to have a, a professional looking aspect, but there are so many features. There are so many different types of plots that you can use. And some of them, or some of the ones that are not there are provided by libraries. So visualization is a huge topic in R. And I'm, again, I'm going to just focus on the basics, but you are welcome to explore many other packages um, even for your assignment that can help you to represent your own data or, or data that is meaningful to you. So I'm going to grab one of the data sets that are brings just to demonstrate how to generate histograms and, and pie charts. Uh, so it's the air quality data, it's one of the defaults or built-in data sets. And histograms are super simple to create. I just use hist command, and then from the data, I'm going to look at the awesome levels of the quality data set. And in this case, I just indicate the awesome column, and boom, I get a histogram with the frequency and the different quantities measured for the, for the level of awesome. Um, I, can, I can try to do a little bit more of analysis on this uh, data set. For instance, classify the bad days when the level is greater than 20 or smaller, should say. Um, create a table, you saw this command when working on assignment three, it's a, it's a frequency analysis tool. Basically, it will identify um, within uh, the month. So the data set contains the level of awesome, but also the dates and within the month, the bad day. So we are slicing only the dates that contain a level of awesome greater or smaller than even threshold. So that's my result. And as you can see now, I have, I have indices corresponding to where the month which bad days were detected and the amount of them. Now, what we can also use is use this month.name uh, data set. Also, it's, it's, it's a built-in data set like the latest data set that we saw before, where we can use the numbers of the results to identify the actual month. And you see where I'm going with this. And um, we can also create the counts from the table. So you, you may recall this, this kind of trick uh, to basically get the numbers from that. 
and then use a pie chart to represent that. So the pie chart is nothing else than the bad month counts where the labels are the actual name of the month and the color is given by a particular uh, palette that R has predefined for us, has a, a different set of palettes. And we're indicating that we want as many colors in this palette as number of entries are in this step. But again, the pie chart is generated just with one single command, similarly as the histogram, there is a little bit of data manipulation just to put this in context and make it uh, a little bit meaningful, okay? So this is an example of how to generate histograms and pie charts in a very, very straightforward. The box command, by the way, in case that you want it, I don't usually use this box command, but it can, it can draw a, a box around the main plot in your, in your graphical representation. Similarly, these are super useful and, and, and kind of very statistically driven type of plots are box plots and whiskers. So the box plot basically summarizes a few statistical quantities for a data set. What we usually see is the median and then the ranges and then upper and lower hinges, the ranges on which the data um, uh, oscillates, but also outliers assuming a normal distribution. So in this case, we are using another of the uh, predefined R data sets is the insect sprays data set. Uh, we, are, we are representing here counts versus spray. By the way, this is another notation, similarly to the linear model notation. This could be revert to say a spray comma count uh, to represent the X, Y notation of the plot. But alternatively, you can say, okay, this is my Y variable as a function of my X variable. Similarly to how we did the relationship for the linear model, the formula expression for the linear model. And then the color is given by uh, something else. The plot that you are actually seeing is the second line where it's basically the same data, but we add some customizations to it. We say notch equal true. So the notch is driving this or drawing these particular triangles which represent some kind of whiskers in the plot. Uh, some people like it, some people dislike it, just showing you that you can do that. Uh, add equal true is to basically add this, these whiskers and then color blue is to say the inner part of the whiskers or this representation of the box plot is set to blue. Again, just showing you a little bit of customization here. Um, other typical plots that you will see, especially people using Excel, likes to do this is bar plots. So bar plots are also possible in R and with a lot of customization as well. So in this case, we are generating just four random values or four random samples with different values. Each sample has four entries. And what we are going to use in this case is the bar plot command. For the bar plot command, you basically indicate the height of the different elements in the bar plot. And in this case, are normalized all to 100. So what I'm doing here is creating a data frame with the columns given by the different samples, and I'm naming them within the data frame. So the sample one is given by X, sample two by Y, sample three by Z, and sample four by W, and that is in my CBind call. Remember, CBind com combines columns to create a new data frame. And what I'm doing here is normalizing everything by 100. So the different values are each of the elements in the vector I divided by the sum, the total sum, and then multiply by 100 in each of the entries. And that's why you get how you get the total number of 100 is because each vector, each sample is normalized with respect to it. Um, then what comes after are options for the bar plot command. So the first entry is the data itself. Besides means that they are not all together. There is some, some gap between them. The width is an additional parameter in the plot that you can add is the width of each of the columns. So this corresponds to the first, second, third, and fourth sample. The colors correspond to the data within the columns. So each uh, entry has a different color, black, red, green, and blue, identified by numbers. Uh, the lesson in the text, which is given here on the top, is again given independently. So again, you can have more information display on this, on this graph. And finally, um, where to display the lesson, it says top right, you can select top for top middle or bottom. So that is a little bit of figuring out where is the best position for displaying the lesson. But again, these are some features, some, some um, uh, capability and options from the bar plot function. No. Again, I, I'm kind of showing you a little bit of what is possible to do in R. Then we are going to focus probably in next class how to perform professional plottings, how to do animations and interactive plots. Uh, this is another of the very, very 
nice features in, in R, heat maps, uh, sort of a matricial representation of data where you can also add uh, dendrograms. So try to find relationships between the different quantities represented in the different axes. Um, there's a lot of customization going on in, a, in, a, in this kind of heat maps. There is a little bit of, of clusterization algorithms playing a role here when the dendrograms are built. So this is another example taking the empty cars from the R data sets. These two quantities are defining palettes or, or color schemes for the different quantities, the rows in this case, and the columns, colors. And then calling the heat map, well, the data has to be formatted as a matrix. That's one of the elements. Then the colors within the heat map can be given by a different palette. Uh, the scales can be determined by rows or columns. And then there's a lot of selection on what quantities you want to display here and there, you know, as well as the labels and the main title. Okay, but this is one of the big, big uh, plots that is easy to do in R. Not much customization other than the one I'm showing here is allowed, but there are some additional packages like pHeatMap or HeatMap2, which allow you to go farther than this. Okay, I'm just letting you know because a lot of people is, 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 is deeply interested in, in this kind of visualizations. Um, so quick, let me see what we have for. So yes, let's, let's finish with this, a quick summary of the commands that we saw, uh, plot, lines, AB lines, histogram, bar plots, the pie chart, a strip chart with it. I, I didn't show you any, any example, but there's another uh, available similarly with the dot chart, box plot we saw. Mosaic plots generates a, a plot similar to the one that we generated when uh, the plot command and the data frame. So it's a kind of uh, all versus all variables within the data frame. You can invoke that plot, actually the plot command calls the mosaic plot underneath to generate that, that kind of uh, visualization. In addition to that, you can add more graphical elements or graphical objects to the visualization, arrows, which are useful sometimes to represent error bars, uh, axis allow you to control the axis. We're going to see this more in detail. Box, we saw an example of the box drawing a rectangle around the, the whole box. Lesson is to uh, basically place the lessons of the plot. Text allow you to add text to a specific uh, places. Points allow you to add points to the plot. And then polygons allow you to draw close polygons within the plot. Sometimes can be useful to demonstrate or, or um, enhance a particular part or region of an inset in a plot or something. All right. Uh, so these are the basic things. So I'm going to stop here now. Um, we are going to reconvene next Monday for talking about two-dimensional and three-dimensional plots in R. And then we're going to be talking about professional plotting and animations, uh, maybe animations and interactive plotting will be another lecture. Um, any questions from what we have seen today, either the linear model part, uh, quadratic model or, or uh, visualization? All right. So if you guys don't have any questions, if there are no questions about the assignment, uh, just a reminder, we're having the office hours on Friday at 1 p.m. as well. Uh, and the due date for assignment four is a, a week from now. So next Monday, midnight. Okay, so if there are no uh, questions, then we're going to stop now. And I'm going to see you either on Friday or, or next Monday. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, good one, everyone.